Hello and welcome to the February 28th, 2024 meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. It is 7.09. We have all members present and Aaron Jock and Dave Zomek, our staff. Um, first up is chair report. Um, my report is that it is February 28th and vernal pools are becoming active. So last night we had wood frogs moving and I think Hitchcock Center is looking for one of the big um, salamander nights. So exciting and also relevant to our, you know, wetlands um, interest. So if anyone wants to get out and <laughs> volunteer for road crossings and whatnot, um, it started. So that's it. And over to Dave. Right. Oh, thanks for that reminder, Michelle. Yeah, we we teamed up. The town has teamed up for 30 years or more with um, with Hitchcock and other groups. So we were coordinating with um, staff at Hitchcock last night and tonight to um, help close part of Henry Street for salamander, wood frog, uh, any any um, amphibians that are moving. Um, so I don't have a report from last night, but there certainly was movement last night and there may be movement tonight. And then the temperature goes down and then we'll see next week looks like some rainy, potential rainy days and nights over over 40 degrees. So yeah, uh, very early. Um, this used to be a mid to late March event and here we are at the end of February. It's not unheard of, but it's it's early. So anyway. Um, we'll hopefully get some salamanders and wood frogs and peepers across the road safely over on Henry Street. And obviously this happens in lots of other places in Amherst and the region. Um, let's see, a couple of quick updates for the commission. Um, Aaron and I are gearing up for a project kickoff. I think I mentioned this to you two weeks ago for a project kickoff for the trails at Hickory Ridge. Um, we are... Um, zeroing in on our selected contractor. I, I have not quite gotten the word on announcing that yet. So um, maybe Aaron can send that out as soon as we get word from our procurement office that we can release that. But suffice it to say that we have a contractor, uh, we have a successful bidding process, and we will be kicking off um, the trail project at Hickory uh, very soon. So uh, we're getting geared up with um, Turtle turtle training and um, and other uh, requirements of a permit from the commission and natural heritage and uh, the planning board and <laughs> all other boards and committees. So uh, it's going to be a, an interesting time out there. Um, let's see. Um, in two weeks, uh, Aaron and I will be giving you a public pre a, a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation on Puffer Spawn. We've got been doing some kind of behind the scenes work, uh, just a little bit of um, uh, kind of uh, visioning work on what Puffer's Pond needs and what Puffer's Pond could be if we had the resources to make some improvements there. So we're excited to bring you some ideas to discuss in two weeks. This is not a this is not a one and done. It's not a thirty minute discussion at your next meeting. It's it's going to be many months of discussions and potential fundraising and and uh, guiding that process. But we're excited to at least get it started. The genesis for that really is coming from the um, improvements that we know we need to make to the dike and dam at Puffer's Pond. I think I've mentioned that to you before. The dike is in poor condition, the dam is in fair condition, and we know the pond needs dredging. So it's a wonderful time to really look at that whole package and say, you know, what do we want Puffer's Pond to look like in five years, 10 years, 20 years? Um, um, because it, it it does need some TLC. So we'll bring you the first presentation on that in two weeks, uh, a nice PowerPoint, uh, which is pretty much done. Um, Hickory, just uh, circling back to that for a, for a second, um, uh, I will be giving a pre an overview presentation to the town council later in March I, or early April. I don't have a date on that, but I'll ask Aaron to send that to you. Um, the town council would like kind of an update. They have not heard, you know a lot more about Hickory than the town council does through, through the notice of intent process um, with us uh, for the trails and with Pier Sky. So I'll be giving an update uh, to them uh, in four to five weeks, and um, I'll I'll send you the date, or Aaron will the date, and if you want to 
uh, come to that meeting via Zoom, uh, you're welcome to do that. And this will be on on everything out there from from uh, solar to trails uh, to permitting and uh, kind of reimagining what uh, the frontage might be on um, um, a Spomeroy Lane. And then lastly, we have been conducting interviews for the commission, um, Michelle, Aaron, myself, and um, one other uh, person uh, uh, have been conducting interviews for uh, commission vacancies. So that's going well. I think by the end of the week, we'll, we have done, what, five of them, Michelle, I think? Um, five or six. So um, seven. Really, seven, maybe. Okay. Seven. <laughs> Very interesting people from all you know, different backgrounds and all of them with, you know, sharing an interest in, in the trails and the, the conservation areas and their love of, of uh, all things Amherst conservation. So um, what happens is that committee then makes a recommendation to the town manager and the town manager uh, decides on an appointment or more depending on number of vacancies. So that's kind of exciting to, to get that process going. So I'll stop there, um, conscious of your time. And um, if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free. Thanks, Dave. Um, Jason, I saw you put your hand down. So uh, good. Okay. Uh, minutes, lots of them 5, 10, 6, 14, 1, 10, 124, and 214. Um, we're looking for a motion to approve them. I move to approve the minutes for 5, 10, 23, 6, 14, 23, 1, 10, 24, 1, 24, 24, and 2, 14, 24. Second. Alex on the motion, Andre on the second. Alex? Aye. Andre? Aye. Bruce? I see your hand, you're an eye. Okay, Laura? Aye. Jason? Aye. I'm an aye. All right, well moved. Um, land management updates. Alex, do you wanna take a minute to give a update on the subcommittee? Yes, sure. The subcommittee, which consists of myself, Michelle and Bruce, with Dave and Aaron regularly participating has been meeting essentially every two weeks with some interruptions. And we have been working through the policy subject by subject. And um, we find that some subjects uh, uh, deserve a deep dive. For example, we're working on agriculture right now and uh, Bruce has been doing that. We would like to bring some things to you fairly soon and we'll probably do that in pieces rather than wait till the whole document is done. For example, um, hope to bring you community gardens and within a month, hopefully bring you agriculture. Um, and uh, we are plugging along, uh, going slower than anticipated, uh, which is probably could have been anticipated. So I apologize for that. That's my report. Thanks, Alex. Aaron, Dave, do we have any open space and recreation plan updates? Um, the the survey mm -hmm. is out um, and it, it's currently being um, populated by the community. I know there's been a pretty robust response so far, so that's good news. Um, and we've gotten some feedback on it, which has been relayed back to the planning department. So um, yeah, it's it's in full full effect. We're hoping to um, have a a couple community events related to it um, to talk about some of the results and, um, you know, action goals of the of the town staff who are working on it um, in the near future. And I'll keep you posted on those. OK, so community events are like post survey sort of. Yeah, I mean, assessment. initially, initially, it was going to be uh, kind of a kickoff to the survey, but um, I think there's some regrouping going on and some thought that we should give the community some time to to fill out the survey before we do that. So we have some results to share. So um, I might have I'll have more information um, probably at the next meeting with regard to 
path forward. Okay. Michelle, if I could just add, you know, just to put a, a point on something Aaron said, one is, you know, despite it being a little bit clunky, we we have heard from the commission and other folks that it is a little clunky, it is a little long. We have a pretty robust response. I don't know the um, the overall number, but people are getting through it. Um, hard copies are available as well to those folks who may not be able to or not want to do it online. Um, the Engage Amherst um, software does allow for quite a bit of 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 analysis and summary. So we're, we're I think we're all looking forward to that. And I can't remember Aaron gave you an up or a presentation on the on the open space and recreation plan. I don't know a month ago or more, um, but. Um, we've seen some of the initial data coming out, so it, it'll be very interesting when we have all of that to share with the commission, um, you know, on on responses, uh, some of the, you know, what are what are those those areas of concern out there on the trails or conservation areas? What are the, the you know, the 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 wants and the needs of our residents relating to, you know, whether it's trails, open space. Um, Etc. So um, it's it's going to be interesting. It's it's um, you know Aaron and I got a sneak peek at some of the the summary data already, and it it's kind of interesting. There's everything from trail conditions to dog issues to what people would like to be able to do out on the conservation land. So it, it's going to be really cool to see it. I think um, yeah. So give us a couple more weeks, and we should have some some data results for you back. Great. Okay. Thanks, Dave. All right, I think we're ready. Or seven, no, oh, we have ten minutes. Um, so the just then to backtrack the engage Amherst, the format is I think a Google form, which I've used before for surveys, and it is a very tidy assimilation of responses and graphic form and otherwise. So hopefully the required ninety questions <laughs> will come in handy when looking at those graphs. Um, I have uh, had some uh, people reach out to me about having trouble finishing it generally like of a, I don't know, certain crowd, but I don't know, hand, hands, quick hands, uh, commissioners, how many people on this commission have taken the survey? Okay, not everybody. <laughs> Yeah, people. <laughs> can, can you resend it, Michelle? I will take it. I just probably get lost in my. Inbox. Yeah, Aaron, do you think you could? Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Spread the word. Okay. Um. Do we have any other business we can do in eight minutes? Not really. Can we? Uh, can we, Excuse me. Can we, well, right. Alex. Can we? Do we have time to flip to the back and and tackle one of the subjects at the end? Discussion on limitations on ongoing continuations. Well, we have seven minutes until our neck or I don't know about that. I think that that's kind of a 15 minute, 20 minute conversation. Um, I will let me announce for the attendees, though, that we have some continuances. Um, so if you're here for Montague Road, Karen Environmental LLC on behalf of LSE Fornax um, Coles Incorporated for the battery storage system that's continued. Pure Sky Development Incorporated on Shootsbury Road is continued. Wetland Wendell Services on behalf of Kevin and Mary O'Brien on 260 Levitt Road is continued. So the only uh, hearings we have tonight is um, Stonefield Engineering LLC for uh, Valley CDC on Ball Lane and engineers on Emerson Court. So any attendees not here for that um, might want to check into, I guess, our next meeting on March, is it 13th, Erin? Yes. Okay. Um, I think maybe we could just uh discuss what those two topics are perhaps on our the other business agendas we have discussing limitations of ongoing continuations we touched on that last meeting um and then we have a second one Erin I see your hand up go ahead yeah um 
I have an update on Fort River School um, mm -hmm. that I that might take a few minutes for us to talk about as well. Um, so just that might be something we could cover. Ahead All of right. Time. Can we do that in six minutes? Yeah. Let's definitely. do it. Um, so the I, I included in your packets a press release, which was sent to me today for the um, kickoff of the Fort River School project. That project um, there, I was contacted today by the project engineers, and um, they have some initial um, uh, traffic, um, uh, some some site work relative to re sort of repatter repatterning traffic on the site that has to be done first. Um, and so they would like to get started on that. I did um, let them know, you know, it's, there's some preliminary things they have to take care of. Um, relative to their, their phasing, I don't really have a problem with them doing the, the work that they have to do for the um, uh, adjustments to the driveways uh, first. So um, I just wanted to give the commission an update that you might see some action going on there, but that the overall... Um, installation of erosion controls for like the new school location, um, et cetera. They're not going to, you know, have erosion controls all set up around those areas until um, all of the traffic related adjustments have been done first. So they have to make sure that um, <clears throat> traffic can get, get in and out of the school parking lot safely um, in order to start phase one. So um you know, there'll be some BMPs installed, but we're going to be doing sort of a phased um, uh, initiation, shall we say, of the, the site work. How soon do you think that's going to be immediately? It might be before our next meeting. So I wanted to make sure that I let you folks know tonight. Um, I did ask them to provide me with a, just a correspondence outlining the exact areas where work was going to be done, uh, make sure we have BMPs installed as necessary for the specific work that's like step number one. Um, so I'll be working with them to make sure that those BMPs are installed. Um, and uh, then once that's all set, we'll we'll do the official sort of pre-construction meeting for phase one. Thanks. Um, switching gears, um, since we have a couple minutes and speaking of Tuckerman, uh, is it appropriate to ask perhaps like what the status of that enforcement order is currently, or if it, what, what happened with that the one? The Tuckerman enforcement order? Yeah. Is it closed? Can you just remind me? Um, yeah. So they filed an RDA after the, after the enforcement to to rectify it. Um, the permit is still active, um, the determination or the, the determination of applicability. Um, they did install silt fence, which I went out and inspected probably uh, two years ago. And they did the site um, preparation, which was tree removal and grubbing of the site. Um, they put a stockpile on the site and I was watching it closely at one point um, getting really concerned about compliance. Um, this was um, pr prior to Jen's departure, but we ended up having a really wet summer. And just that site kind of got really bushy with vegetation. Um, and so it stabilized itself pretty quickly. So I backed off of um, approaching them about it. Um, their silt fence, though, is in really bad shape. So um, before any site work happens there, they need to basically refresh all of their BMPs. And ultimately there was a restoration associated with the um, enforcement and the home construction that were required. So um, those are outstanding. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Alex. Going back to the school, I understand that the RFPs went out not too long ago and um uh and they're they're going to be rerouting traffic now i didn't think that project was actually going to start construction until the summer yeah i mean i think there's some preliminary work they have to do um to set up sort of the the um first phase which includes um 
the existing access road and the parking lot, which is used for parent pick up and drop off. And so they have to come up with an alternative for the parent pick up and drop off and also an alternative um, system for the buses. So right now the buses come in and pull in front of the school um, from the main entrance. And what's gonna happen is that all three entrances are going to be where the current exit is now. There'll be one new um, entryway through there. And so buses are actually gonna be driving around the school. Yeah. I didn't um, think it, that was going to be during the school year. I thought the construction yeah. was going to start after the school year, but I I don't need to straighten it out now. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, real quickly. Um, so so some of the stripping of the topsoil is going to be happening sooner than later. So that's that's coming fairly quickly. So that that'll be kind of in addition to these access ways, removing the topsoil from the playing fields and the site where the school will go um, is gonna happen in March and April. So that's why the first yeah. step is, okay. is dealing yeah. with the access ways. Got it. Okay, we're good then. Um, let's move on to our 7.30 um, procedures. Do you want to bring folks in, Erin, and I'll yes. read? Okay, so um, all right. So each hearing has twenty dedicated minutes on the agenda. Five minutes of comments from staff. Five minutes from applicants. Five minutes for public comment, or two minutes per person. Five minutes for conservation commissioners. Conservation Commission is requiring all submitted revised material to be submitted by Wednesday, the week prior to the meeting at the close of business. Um, for all presenters, please clearly state your name, your address, and who you're representing, as well as preferred pronouns. But for members of the public, please clearly state your name, address, and note if you have preferred pronouns. Okay. I think we're good on this. So this is notice of intent for the engineer on behalf of Emerson Court Condominium Association for the replacement of existing driveways and drainage improvements within the buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands on Emerson Court, map 8B, 18B, lot 61. So you'll have to open this one, Michelle. Oh, this isn't open. Okay. Uh, this public hearing is now called to order. The hearing is being called as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of the wetlands as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. Okay, I think we have... Oh, hi, Bucky. Welcome. Hello. Good evening. It's nice to be back. Um, I'll just uh, move forward. Uh, my name is Bucky Sparkle, pronouns he, him, and I'm here to talk about um, uh, what I, I hope is a relatively rudimentary process of repaving an existing driveway and a couple other minor drainage improvements over at Emerson Court. Um, I've submitted the plans and the application. We did the site walk earlier yesterday yesterday not today <laughs> and um what i'm going to do is just bring up the the plans and kind of walk everyone through it i'm happy to answer questions at any point <clears throat> um just to locate the site this is route nine Belchertown road gatehouse road and at the corner of stony hill and gatehouse is where emerson court resides looking at an aerial view and to give people a sort of a real world sense of what's going on, Emerson Court is composed of three buildings and three driveways. This is a slightly older photo from 2014. The upper driveway was repaved some years ago, but after 2014, I wasn't involved with that. So I, I'm not sure when it happened. I was all outside of the buffer zone anyway. However, the middle drive going down the hill and at the lowest end, the bottom drive, um, these were built in the late 70s, if I recall, or around 1980, and they're, they're shot. Uh, there are drainage problems, there are some flooding problems, and it's time to uh, replace them. You will see this sort of uh, greenish area is my sort of ham-handed approximation of the wetland that is survey located, um, but this is not the survey. 
So there's a detention basin down here and running through the woods is a, sort of a gully. It is not an intermittent stream. It's just sort of a low point and it has, uh, it definitely is a BVW. Looking at the survey of this same area, see the three buildings and the two hatched areas of pavement. Uh, I'm also indicating um, some of the infrastructure, uh, but first is, uh, this is the wetland line that Ward Smith flagged, it was survey located. Uh, we have the 25 and 50 and 100 foot buffers affiliated with that. Virtually all of the work is outside of the 50 foot buffer with very minor exceptions, which I'll get to on the next page. Um, and what I show uh, here is uh, the red lines are erosion controls that are going to be strategically located based upon topography and possibility of any silt moving uh, off site once the pavement is removed. And uh, there are also several catch basin inlets in the vicinity, all of which will have uh, um, catch basin inlet filters, um, like the real ones, not just sheets of geotextile. I've also highlighted a couple dashed orange lines, which I don't need to zoom in on. I think, whoops, that's a whole building. Uh, but the dashed lines are existing uh, drainage ways, drainage pipes for the roof drainage that have failed. They are no longer functioning. We have done a TV of them, inspected them. We've tried to hydro jet them, totally defunct. And the old orange brick pipe material is um, just falling apart. So we're going to be replacing a few of those. The solid orange lines are the um, existing, I'm gonna call primary drainage uh, that bring water from both the development and the municipal, the Stony Hill Road drains into this catch basin and, and this one that all come through the development and come down to the detention basin here. I'm gonna move on to the proposed work and um, I may zoom in a little bit here just because we're seeing more than, you know, where the action is really happening. So let me try to snug in a little bit here. And <clears throat> again, so that we're going to start with the, you know, noting that the new pavement is actually going to be um, a little less square footage. We're reducing the impervious area, um, not significantly, but we, we are reducing it. Uh, we are adding a couple of additional inlets where there is currently um, some flooding and standing water on the property and we're reconnecting those new inlets to the um, existing stormwater system in general the things that um, generally you know catch the attention of the commission and are fall under the purview of the wetlands protection act and bylaws uh, is we're going to talk about work that's within the 50 foot buffer which is that line here um, and right up to it. So let me start at the uphill end. We're adding a new catch basin here, connecting existing drains to it. Those drains currently come down to this pipe, this line, and just shoot straight into the detention basin. Uh, well, my intention is um, both to build less pipe and to disconnect uh, the roof water and a lot of this pavement water from going directly to the um, detention area in the wetland is to discharge it to the surface over here where it's going to then move into this gully uh, and so have a, a couple hundred feet of um, contact with the earth, um, slow down, you know, soak in a bit uh, and also slow down the peak uh, discharge rates from the site. Uh, in doing that, I'm going to be adding um, about 55 feet of pipe to go from a new catch basin in toward the woods uh, when I was out there with Aaron and Jason. Uh, and as my plan note indicates, um, if you bothered to read the small print, it says um, this pipe can go kind of anywhere. So let's not kill any trees that they need to show me exactly where it's going. And uh, I want to make sure that we're not damaging any of the trees in that area. There's no need for that. We have lots of options and it's going to be sort of a combination of, you know, the, the really the, the path of least resistance and, and maintaining the vegetation there. Um, the other pipe that is going beyond the existing footprint of pavement 
is this pipe here. Uh, and that is because we are adding a catch basin uh, at this location, draining uh, this area and reconnecting um, roof drains that have failed. There's an existing drain manhole right here. So this is a very easy way and direct way to connect that water to the existing drain system. And it goes right where it was going into the, to the, uh, into the detention basin. That pipe is between the 25 and the 50 foot buffer. So it's 21 feet long. So we've got some amount of disturbance within that buffer zone. And both for this pipe and this pipe uphill, these two new ones into um, you know what's yard right now, uh, we will be restoring those areas immediately and uh, employing, in addition to grass seed, uh, a biodegradable mat blanket to uh, help stabilize that as soon as possible. Of course, there are also um, silt fence, or uh, these are sediment logs up here because it's going to be low volume. Now, when we did walk the site um, this yesterday, uh, Aaron had the great idea to go down and look at these outlets in more detail, which a couple of years ago, I remember looking at this one, but we looked at the others. This, the, all of them have some amount of sediment that can literally be scooped out with a shovel. Hand tools, no machinery whatsoever, no disturbance to the BBW. Uh, this one right here, um, the head wall, the, the, it was a masonry head wall that's a combination of granite blocks and um, mortar. Uh, it sits on a concrete pad, so there's a, a splash pad for the outlet. A large, what I'm going to call a four bowl tree, a four trunk tree, has grown up right at the back side of that head wall, has broken it, has knocked it down, and it's just sitting there in the wetland. So we're going to um, get a silt fence down here. We're going to pick up that debris. Uh, we will need to remove that tree because it is grown into the head wall location and the end of the pipe. And we need to rebuild the head wall, impossible with the tree there. So we'll be pulling that out um, right at the embankment. And it will cause a, a very small amount of temporary disturbance. Um, and it's hard to say if it's even in the BBW because they're where we're going to do most of that work is really a concrete splash pad. Uh, that tree does need to come out. The root system does need to come out. Um, but whatever disturbance uh, ends up being necessary to replace that pipe end is going to be immediately stabilized, seated, and, and have a, a blanket put back on it. Other than that, uh, the work is uh, under existing pavement. We're reducing the pavement area. I know obviously there's a little more going on here than you know, I'm talking about, but that's because it's outside of the 100 foot buffer zone, but it is all simply you know, repairing or replacing existing infrastructure. And um, I do have you know a few details, et cetera, that we can talk about. Um, I, I think we can maybe uh, public comment. If you have a comment, please raise your hand. I'm gonna keep an eye on it. Um, Thanks, Bucky. Commissioners, it sounds like Jason was out there. I don't know if anyone else. Yeah, thanks for doing the visit, Jason. Um, do we have any commissioner questions or comments on this? None? Okay. Um, so that four uh, trunk tree that's in the buffer, Bucky, that's it is it wasn't survey located i will i will fully admit um because it was just yesterday that this sort of became a a consideration i'm going to zoom into that location um we do have the surveyor you know they've they've identified the outfall and the elevation so we know that the end of the pipe is exactly here which puts the um boy i don't know if i can sketch this in easy enough uh, but there's a head wall roughly there and the tree, let's see if I can get my magic crayon to do something again, is, is right here. I mean, as well, it's, eh, I'm going to move it. It's like here, which is why it has broken the, the head wall. So based upon, you know, my, my guesstimate that you just watched me make, uh, I don't, I don't, I expect that we are, yeah, we're going to be right, right into that that magic line, the green line is the wetland line. So okay, is it a pine tree? 
No, it's not. I'm not sure what kind of tree it is. Deciduous. Anyone? This is the a photo of it, if this helps. Um uh, I can stop the share. Yeah. I'm not I'm not sure what kind of tree it was. Um a maple maybe. I'm not I'm not certain. You can mm -hmm. see the rubble uh that's laying on the concrete splash pad. Um if my looking at this, my instinct was that the root ball would need to come out to rebuild it. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can leave the root ball in place, which would be preferred because, you know, we have a lot. We have no soil disturbance in that case, except for, you know, where the head wall used to be. So maybe we can work that out and leave the root ball in place. I mean, we can take that as a preferred path. It'd certainly be faster and cheaper. So that would be great. But it may not be physically possible. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I have also... a question. Sorry. Go ahead, Andre. Yeah, uh, how do you plan to take that out? Um, I mean, that's the, you know, how you how you access it and uh, how you're going to pull that root ball out if you have the need to. It, and, it, uh, and it looks to me like it's a uh, red maple. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, my anticipation is that a tracked vehicle and excavator would likely uh, come down through the buffer zone, zone to the edge of the BBW would assist uh, with somebody with a chainsaw and get those trees to come down and fall in a controlled direction. Excavators are really helpful in getting trees to fall to where you want them to. Uh, then once you have the stump, you know, if, if we're able to leave the stump, great. If not, then the excavator itself would, would just pluck that right out and it would be disposed of offsite. One thing I will say relative to the trees, there is pretty decent tree cover here. So the removal of that tree isn't going to impact the um, the basal area of that wetland dramatically at all. Um, it's surrounded by um, by trees on either side. So. Okay, so a little a quick follow up. Um, you said that you would uh, be bringing a uh, tract uh... Uh, tracked working vehicle down there. Um, that is that through the BBW? No. no, no, it would be from the pavement through the buffer and it would operate outside of the buffer zone. The only thing that would end up in the BBW is people standing there to, to make the, to make the work happen. So no machinery in the wetland. All right. Thank you. Go ahead, Alex. A couple of comments. Um, I presume it, the the tree was of that multi-stemmed tree that was in the left-hand side of the photo. Yes. And uh, it may have been a stump sprout, but if you cut the tree and don't kill it uh, with herbicides, then it's going to re-sprout. It, it's already got a, an established root system, plenty of water, and you're, you're, you're really not going to get rid of your problem. Um, so if you're going to just cut it, uh, I don't think that's solving a problem. And if you're going to remove it, it'll that root system's all over the place, sucking up that water. Um, is it possible to move the uh, end of the pipe out of the fifty foot and and reestablish the the outlet um, outside of the wetland boundary? Um, let me look at the plan and see how likely that is. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the elevation um, as 179.3. It's a pretty steep slope coming down in there. Uh, so the, I mean, to move it, we'd have to install a, um, a new manhole, redirect the pipe, trench through the buffer and back, you know, up to the edge of the BVW. Um, there are other trees through there, so you know we we would likely be able to pick a location where there wasn't an existing tree right now. Um, so I didn't have a clear view. I'm sorry, I didn't see other trees and whatnot. So um, I'll just take your word for it. But if it if if you could just simply pull back and sever the pipe four or five feet back and put in a new drainage way you could leave the tree where it is and but i don't know whether that's more work less work 
Um, so I'll just leave it at that. More or less work. I, it's it's not a significant amount of work. Like I I think we're starting, you know, we're potentially splitting hairs in terms of effort. Like I want to do the right thing down here because all the options are relatively simple. Um, so you know, I want to make sure that the commission is happy. Pulling it back, um, you would have to remove, you still have to create a channel. So wherever the pipe was and wherever those tree roots are, you're still gonna have to cut all of that out uh, earth. And then you've created some embankments and you're also going to be disturbing some amount of BVW. Again, a handful, like just a few square feet um, in survey isn't <laughs> so accurate to say that it's three square feet or, or anything like that, but we're talking just a handful of square feet of disturbance. But I, I no matter, no matter what you do, I cannot see a way of uh, not taking out that that bank to some degree. The um, okay, I'll just potentially. I'll just leave it alone and go with the whatever the least impact is, and it's not a big deal to me. Okay, okay thanks, Alex. Go ahead, Aaron. Um, so I just wanted to point something out, which I think is a really important historical context about this sort of so-called BDW that these pipes flow into. Um, it is a BVW because there has been um, drainage directed toward it since probably the 70s when this um, development was constructed. But it was actually that BVW, which is where those pipes are discharging, was constructed as a detention basin. And if you, um, I can <clears throat> shoot back to the photos so you can take a quick look, but sort of contextually, this was a pre-Wetland Protection Act designed um, stormwater system with a detention basin where all of the drainage from the site discharged. And just over the years, because of the, um, you know, all of the water inputs, it's basically um, turned into a BVW. So um, we had some discussions in the field about this because, um, you know, digging it out, there are some regulatory implications of that at this point, and they're not really interested in in um, dredging out the old detention basin, which has reverted to wetland. Um, but I, I am a little concerned that pulling out, like, for me, reviewing this project, it's a relatively minor project, relatively low impact, um, replacing some infrastructure to Im improve drainage and improve water quality. And if we start wholesale pulling out like pipe systems and drainage systems to relocate them, I think we're going to be creating significantly more impact in doing so. Um, and also, we're not going to be directing it into this area that was designed to be a detention basin. Um, it's going to be directed elsewhere, which could cause scour and other other issues. So, Thanks, Aaron. Jason, go ahead. Yeah, my comment was essentially what Aaron was saying, that it seemed at the site that removing the tree was going to be the least amount of disturbance um, that the you know as i understand it bucky right the splash pad the concrete splash pad for uh, erosion control and energy dissipation is going to remain in place it's just the head wall and potentially you know three to four feet of pipe behind it that are going to need to be replaced uh, so you know a, a good portion of that infrastructure is going to remain in place so you know and <laughs> there's a lot of trees around that area you know i would say if 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 the concern is with the tree, potentially we would pro propose the planting of one or two red maples in that area as, uh, you know, compensatory mitigation, if you will, or just or just uh, recognizing that that tree needs to come out. You know, there's a lot of drainage that goes down that pipe off of Stony Hill and everything. And, um, it'd be this is a good opportunity to fix a piece of infrastructure with little disturbance. Thanks, Jason. I was going to ask if planting something somewhere, I mean, I, Aaron, uh, segued to the pictures and there are a lot of trees. I don't know how many of them are native. I don't know what the composition is there, but maybe just, you know, tree for a tree. I would suggest an oak tree. I would, I think that, you know, some kind of oak, native oak is probably the biggest bang for the buck ecologically. Um, 
I'd like to, I mean, I, I agree with Aaron and Jason. This seems like a improvement on drainage and least impact. So I'd like to keep moving this on. Um, I see Bruce has his hand up. You're muted, Bruce. Alex is first. Go ahead, Alex. Alex, you're muted. Okay. Yeah, just for the record, I wasn't trying to save the tree. Um, and I, my comment was, if you don't kill it, it it's just going to come back and remain a problem with your new wall. Yeah, so, I agree that might be a problem. Um, it looks pretty suckered. That, yeah, that, that was my major point. All right, Bruce, go ahead. Um, I I see a, a more people coming in as, as visitors, so are there any for this one? You mean public yeah. comment? Yes. Um, I will re-announce if you have public comment for this particular hearing, please raise your hand. Um, otherwise, I think, okay, so I think two of us have mentioned potential a uh, tree planting. It looks like there's enough yard there that could do with some shading anyway. Is that possible, Bucky, do you think? Uh, there's plenty of room for Great. a tree down there, no problem. Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, I, I hear what Alex is saying. I think there might be problems with that in the future with the tree just re-sprouting. So um, I assume that you'll be paying attention to that. So we don't have to see this in another 15 years, but I'll leave that to you. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Aaron, do you think we can add that to the order of conditions? Just a planting of one tree. Yep. Let's make it an oak tree. Okay. Yep. All right, then I'll, uh, I'll move to close the public hearing for Emerson court and issue orders of conditions DEP number 089-0732 under the State Wetlands Protection Act and under Wetlands Protection Town of Amherst General Bylaws, Article 3.31 and regulations with the draft up boilerplate and special conditions along with the addition of the planting of one native oak tree. Second. Jason on the motion, Andre on the second. Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Andre. Aye. Alex. Hi. Laura. Hi. I'm an I. All right. So moved. Thank you, Bucky. Thank you very much. We'll Look. see you another time. Okay. Thanks, Bucky. <laughs> Have a good one. All right. Um, so or 740, if anybody is here for the Pure Sky Development Incorporated on behalf of WD Coles at Shoot Spray Road, that meeting is being continued and we are looking for a motion, unless Aaron, you have an update that you'd like to give us first. Um, yeah, so I just, I jumped ahead on the slide by accident, Michelle, and we have mm -hmm. the Karen Environmental Consulting first. No, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. no, that's okay. That was my fault. Um. So yeah, I'll just give a, a really quick update on this. Um, the applicant did request a continuance at my urging. And the reason for that was because um, I recommended that the applicant have a, um, a meeting with uh, various town departments to get some sort of additional interdepartmental comment on the, on the um, proposed design before we come back to the Conservation Commission. And also to give them some time to incorporate those potential um, comments. Uh, it The applicant, um, I think, needs a little more input from other departments before the commission can really um, reconsider uh, their proposal. So they're, they're willing to do that, and we're going to be scheduling a meeting to do that. So that's why there's a need for a continuation. Was that my recommendation? Okay. And um, I think several members were out on the site visit. I was out of town and I would like to make that site visit. I don't know if that's going to be sort of contingent upon their meetings with other town um, departments, but uh, if anyone didn't make it and is interested in visiting, maybe we could coordinate on that. Yeah, I'd be happy to um, organize another site visit for the folks who missed it. Thanks. Okay. Um, with that, I think we're looking for a motion to continue this one. 
I will move to continue the public hearing for the Montague Road battery storage NOI to 745 on 3 13 Second. Jason on the motion. Bruce on the second. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye. Laura? Aye. Aye. All right. I'm an aye. Okay. Um, Pure Sky Development mm -hmm. Incorporated. On behalf of WD Coles um, at Shoots Bay Road. So this one is also being continued. Erin, do you have any updates on this one before we make a motion? Yes. So just to give everybody a quick update, um, our peer reviewer, as you all know, walked the site with the applicant's representative and gave, uh, had some um, revisions for the um, delineation. Um, we got a plan which was reviewed and commented on by our peer reviewer um, and uh, a second revision came out and the second revision was reviewed and commented on by our peer reviewer. Um, we've had we're going on sort of round three at this point and all of the revisions have not yet been incorporated. So what I am doing is I'm taking Emily's written commentary, which is in a narrative format, and I'm actually marking up the plan and sending it back to Pure Sky with the expected revisions um, that need to come back to us because I just want to make it crystal clear that the recommendations of the peer reviewer need to be incorporated onto the plan. Um, unless there's some specific area that they're disputing, um, they should be incorporating the, the edits per our peer reviewer. So um, I'm in the process of, of putting that communication together and sending it to the applicant um, probably before the end of the week. And um, while we while they continue to address the peer reviewer's comments, they have requested a continuation to the meeting on March 13th. Thanks, Aaron. All right, unless there's any commissioner questions or anything, I think we're looking to just continue this one. I move to continue the public hearing for Shootsbury Road, ANRAD to 7.50 p.m. on 3.13.24. So again. Alex on the motion, Bruce on the second, Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Andre. Aye. Alex. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. And uh, Michelle, do we, do we take public comments for these where we're just pushing the hearing back? Um, well, we can. So if there are public comments on this, um, you know, it's sort of up to my discretion, I guess, and I'm willing okay. to hear it. Um, for any public in attendance, if you have any public comment, please just raise your hand. It's kind of easier for me to keep an eye on the room before um, the hearing. So I don't see any. Um, so we're just going to move on. Yeah. And then I will take some at the very end. Okay. Um, next up is our NOI for Wendell Wetland Services on behalf of Kevin and Mary O'Brien for the construction of a new 1,200 square feet single family home and associated site work within Riverfront area of East Brook at 260 Levitt Road, Map 3A, Lot 50. The project is proposed as a riverfront redevelopment project replacing an existing garage and chicken coop structure. Um, again, continued. Any questions on this one or updates from Aaron? I, I can give a quick update. Um, I did receive a survey design plan um, and just an initial sort of preliminary to review. And there was a couple edits that needed to be made to it before it comes to the Conservation Commission as well. There's some edits being made to the septic design, but the, the applicant is making headway. Um, so I expect that probably by the 13th, we're going to have a plan. At least that's my hope. Great. Okay. All right, move to continue the uh, public a, hearing for 261 Road. Oh. Hey, yep. Yeah. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, were you going to have a site visit, Erin, before our next meeting? Once we get a plan, I'll schedule a site visit. Once we get a, a plan that's... that's. Uh, so the answer is yes? Yes. Thank you.
Andre? I move to continue the public hearing for 260 Leverett Road to 7.55 p.m. on 3.13.24. I can. Andre on the motion, Jason on the second. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. Laura? Moved to Alex. Alex? Aye. Laura? All right, we don't have Laura on this one. Can we just, that's fine, right? I'll note it. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, moving on to notice of intent for Stonefield Engineering Design, uh, LLC on behalf of Valley CDC for the construction of a 15 residential duplex structure and associated site work, including parking, utilities, stormwater management, and landscaping within the buffer zone at 20 to 40 ball lane map 5A lot 56. All right, so we have some project applicants with us tonight. Is it okay if I do a quick intro before the presentation? You're bringing them on? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna, I'll pull in the folks. Um, so, the applicant did provide a plan update to me um, by the deadline this past Wednesday. And after it was received, um, I did meet with the applicant um, to review the plan. And um, based on the plan changes, I came up with some recommendations uh, for the proposed mitigation plan, which was received today based on my comments. I have drafted the order of conditions um, to incorporate the um, the mitigation plan that was submitted as part of the application. And um, I think that they have proposed a pretty robust mitigation plan to compensate for um, impacts. So um, I just wanted to make sure I just lead with that. Thanks, Aaron. Um, okay, that's in our packets. If there's any public comment on this, please start raising your hands now. Um, I don't see any raised, so we're going to turn it over to the applicants, Josh or Jessica. Do you want to give us an update presentation? Sure. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Josh and let him take the majority of it, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. You guys can hear me all right, right? Yep. Perfect. I was just coming from a WebEx. I wanted to make sure Zoom was working. So thank you again for having us. Again, Stonefield Engineering, Josh Klein, I'm a professional engineer uh, with Stonefield, and we're here for Valley Community Development. So um, I think Aaron kind of led on with, with where we've been. There's There's been a lot of coordination and collaboration, you know, both in our internal team uh, with some of our consultants, including a soil investigation group as well as kind of the landscape team, architecture team, and then ultimately kind of working with Aaron in the town to hopefully, you know, get to a point here where everyone can can be happy to move the project forward. So I'm just going to open up the latest set of plans, and then I want to share a mitigation exhibit that we, we kind of put together. So it's probably easiest to initially kind of talk through with the grading plan. So one of the, the biggest things from last meeting to this meeting, and really the reason we we decided to continue a meeting in between is we went out and did a series of extensive soil testing um, previously. And we, you know, we did it, there was initial soil testing done, and then we did additional soil testing. And a lot of times we would rely on that initial soil test. Um, but in this case, because of the low groundwater and groundwater fluctuations we found, we went out and did that additional testing. Now, when we did that testing, what we found was that the groundwater um, actually kind of moves up the hill. So it mounds its way up the hill, which is really, you know, when we look at these projects from a stormwater perspective, is not as common um, of what you see. And it, it probably relates to the, the hydrology and the type of soils in the area. You know, a lot of times what you can expect, especially when you're around wetlands, is you can kind of approximate the wetland elevation, you know, kind of where that, that wet baseline is. And usually that elevation hold somewhat steady. Now it may gradually kind of increase in areas, but what we found on the site is really as we work our way up the hill, groundwater is kind of maintaining about that 24 um, inch kind of depth throughout. And where that becomes important is it makes it very, very challenging 
to move the stormwater system away from the lowest part of the site. So kind of the biggest change that kind of from the last meeting to this meeting was the redesign of the stormwater. Buildings are in the same place, parking's in the same place. We're preserving um, the kind of the mature vegetation um, kind of along Montague Road. But what we've done is we've we've had to move the stormwater system kind of towards the intersection of DOT roadway in order to maintain that proper separation. And you can really kind of see that with this new edge of the basin, how it actually follows the contour line. And that really is strategic because we have to maintain that groundwater separation. Um, one of the other big differences is the basin got about half the size. So we actually were able to shrink the size of the main infiltration system by about half. And the reason we were able to do that um, is that we kind of incorporated a series of small scale infiltration and bioretention practices throughout the site. So you'll actually see, you know, one of those bioretention systems um, along the Mountain View Road driveway, you'll see these kind of small scale infiltration depressions kind of throughout the site. And what's really nice about these is they provide kind of that low impact development design where you're you know, you're incorporating your stormwater, you know, right into your kind of development. Um, and, you know, it, it kind of breaks the mold a little bit from, you know, how a lot of times engineers traditionally look at sites, whereas you pick up all the water in conveyance and you move it to a single infiltration system. Um, in this case, we've created these little pockets throughout the site um, that create usable areas for residents, but also have a dual purpose, to provide stormwater management. Um, so that is really kind of the, the reason for the shift kind of to this upper corner. And, and just to kind of, you know, for the commission to understand some things that we looked at and thought about is, you know, we looked at, you know, this idea of, of moving the basin kind of to the south a little bit. And what we really found is we would compromise this mature vegetation and we'd have to come in here and kind of clear cut, you know, this mature vegetation to move the basin over here. And you really wouldn't see much of a benefit, um, you know, kind of to this buffer area which I'll kind of show on the mitigation summary um, that you're kind of seeing now. Uh, we also looked at, you know, I think one of the questions that comes up, right, when you look at the plan is, you know, why not just move the basin here? Um, and the reason really is, is this area climbs about, um, about 10 feet, and there's no way to put a basin here without having to fill the entire site, you know, three, four, five, six, seven plus feet. So it would, you know, A would be impractical, B, the impact of bringing in that much fill, you know, would have kind of a, a negative impact to these surrounding wetlands as well. I mean, you'd be having to truck in, you know, an unimaginable amount of dirt. And it really it ultimately would take kind of this nice existing open meadow uh, and create this large structural infiltration system. So what we did, I think, to kind of make it a little bit easier tonight to talk about, and what I think is really nice is this plan can kind of be wrapped right into the order of conditions um, to really highlight exactly you know, what are the mitigation efforts um, that the teams kind of come up with? So, you know, we've we've had a few strategies kind of coming into it, you know, is finding area that we can preserve, you know, incorporating, you know, native wildflower mixes, incorporating native soil mixes, um, creating a schedule to kind of protect these preserved areas, um, you know, thinking about kind of creating wildlife value. You know, you today you have these areas, which are really, you know, there's there's someone that comes and and mows them, um, you know, on mows them multiple times of year, um, hays the field, the wetland kind of ditch along Pulpit Hill Road is is clear cut on a regular basis. So a lot of these, you know, buffer areas, you know, have not been kind of allowed to, um, you know, kind of be preserved in some type of way. Um, so what we've done is kind of in the northern area, so this is wetland area A and B, um, this is the majority of this area is an existing meadow. Um, so you can kind of see the, the area to the right is going to be that kind of new area preservation. So that entire 100 foot buffer uh, will be protected. We're proposing signs along the edge of it, um, kind of calling that area out to be protected. We're proposing bird boxes in that area as well. And then area, any areas that are disturbed as part of the construction, there is a stormwater pipe that has to run through it, would be replanted with a uh, with a native wildflower mix. So it, it gives an opportunity for this area uh, to be protected in, in longevity. Um, you know, the 
you know, any future kind of development or improvements, community areas, gardens, you know, things of that nature would all be outside of the, the buffer uh, based on the order conditions being drafted. Now, we did want to kind of talk a little bit about the stormwater area, just so I think we understand, you know, what's happening. So again, today it's, it is a meadow. Any areas that are disturbed um, outside of kind of the required river stone areas will be replanted with a native wildflower mix. So again, it'll allow this area to kind of flourish into the into the future as well. And then the basin itself, it's it's not going to be a gravel basin. It's not going to be um, covered in sand. It's it's going to be planted with a native a, a wet tolerable mix. So it you know it probably ultimately will will start to almost um, play well into what the existing meadow is and you'll probably see some different types of species kind of grow in it. Now the other thing to note is this is not a, a high value resource wetland along Pulpa Hill Road. Um, it is a drainage ditch that likely over time is overgrown and, and taken on properties of, of wetland feature. There's a you know for example there's an existing pipe that runs through it. So you know we there is you know kind of being proposed the ability to maintain that which is um, you know we've kind of basically noted that these areas cannot be mowed more than two times a year. Um, so they could, you know, decide that they don't need to mow the ditch for two or three years, or they could decide that, you know, they they have to mow it those one or two years to kind of help properly maintain it. Um, and the other big thing is we are restricting when these areas can be mowed. So right now, someone can kind of, you know, without any restrictions that exist today, they kind of come in and mow it, you know, when they please. So now it won't be able to be mowed Kind of during that nesting season so from april 15th to september 15th these areas will be protected which i think is a nice um way to maintain the area uh, to a degree but also allow it to to have that wildlife value um as we work our way to the the south of the site uh, this was the area i think last time we were here we spoke about the invasives management plan so that invasives management plan will still be in effect we've kind of highlighted the approximate area in orange where that exists. And we are gonna kind of do some additional protection back here. So we're proposing four signs at the limit, basically of a, we've been calling these like the limited use areas or really the, the yards or the backyards for the, for the home. So there'll be signs placed there so that residents cannot go beyond that. There's no clearing permitted. Um, there's no disturbance in the area. We're also gonna put on the signs that there's no dumping. I think, you know, that's obviously, you know, something we don't want people doing, you know, residents or non-residents. So those signs will also include notes to be no dumping. Um, what we've kind of yeah. highlighted in the darker green, that's that existing natural vegetation that's gonna remain as part of the project. The kind of shade, um, lighter green that I'm kind of highlighting here. That's existing meadow that, you know, any of those areas disturbed, that area is going to be replaced with that, with that native wildflower mix. So to really let that, that meadow continue to thrive. And then the lightest shade of green, which I'm kind of highlighting here, it was touched on last time. Those are going to be the areas that consist of um, that native um, no mow type grass. So those areas, you know, could be mowed as, as often or as um, not as kind of the, the individual homeowners seem fit. So kind of allows some kind of protection back here as well. So this this plan, and again, it kind of includes the, the notes discussed. These are also were kind of added as order of conditions in terms of the, the mowing and the maintenance. Um, this really highlights- Josh, um, do you think you could sort of wrap this up in like a minute or something? Sorry, yeah, I just want to give time to commissioners. Okay, great. So yeah. just to clarify, the plan is what we're looking at right now. There's no narrative other than this map and then the very small print and the call out boxes. Is this the entire mitigation plan? Well, it is a full size 24 by 36 mitigation summary. So yes, okay. this is the plan. Um, I guess the question, and we don't have to answer this right now, is like who's going to be in charge of um, enforcing it and monitoring it? Um, like, I can't imagine that a homeowner will be handed this plan or the OMP crew is going to be handed this plan. I mean, I guess I'm just wondering, like, who's going to be knowing about that um, no mo from April to September? And who's going to maintain the signs and how are the homeowners going to know why and where they can't be sort of infringing upon that? Um, I, I can answer area. that. So we do have draft condo documents that have already been drafted part of the ZBA process. So we have a um, 
a master document and um, and homeowner bylaws. And as part of the requirement for this project and the funding requirement, we are required to hire a property management company to provide property management services for the homeowner association. So this is a condo association, homeowner association, there'll be a property management company. Um, there will be, these will be tied into the rules and regs and the master deed and the master deed will reference both the order of conditions and the ZBA um, conditions of the permit. So it'll be well documented, um, the maintenance of this. Okay, great. In in sort of a narrative like form that's easy to read and follow. Okay. Yeah, um, we'll have then, lots of um, different things that need to be maintained over the course. The stormwater system itself will have an right. operation and maintenance plan. So there will be lots of documents that will be provided to property management. Okay, great. And then my other question is, what is the proposed like signage um, spacing and how many signs along the buffers of the mitigation area? Is it going to be like one or two or like, you know, spaced 30 feet across the border of it, just so that for residents, it would be very clear, like where the line is. Mm -hmm. So in the, I'll just pull the exhibit back up. I think you um, had four signs on the back, right? And correct. So there's two the front. Signs dots. Okay. Yeah. The back. Okay, great. They're about 80, I would say about 80 feet and then three signs on the front, maybe about a hundred feet. I think the goal was, you know, not to oversign the natural areas, yeah. but obviously more than more than one or two signs. Great. Um, and then last question for me is the bird nesting box. What what's your intent? What species? Like bluebirds? Is there actual like bluebird habitat there? Is it what's the, <laughs> um because they they do have to be designed and specified so that they're not just sort of um predated by you know pests. But sure. um um, we'll take whatever recommendations from the Conservation Commission or from Erin if she wants to provide feedback on the type of bird boxes. I love bluebirds, but I know, and we have a bluebird box here at our house, but I know that it does get taken over by by others, not necessarily bluebirds. So um, we're open to any recommendations that the commission might have on that. Okay. Um maybe Erin can chime in. I haven't been here, but maybe I'll do a drive by. All right, thanks guys. Alex, question? Yes, make sure I'm on mute. Okay, um, I like the idea of signs, but I'm thinking back, thinking ahead 15, 20 years, signs can disappear, they can get pulled out of the ground. Rocks don't tend to move. Uh, could it, would it be possible to, and we've used rocks in other places to mark boundaries. Uh, would it be possible to put large rocks along the line uh, to help identify um, a boundary in addition to signs? So I think the our preference would be to keep the area kind of natural and how it exists today, kind of this open meadow without kind of structured features, whether they be rocks or fences or things like that. Now, again, if the, the commission felt very strongly, and you know, I think it's a, a balance we could look into. Again, we don't want to create this kind of rock wall here um, you know, budget is, we're very budget sensitive to this project. This is obviously a um, an affordable rocks. housing development. So I think that's the, the balance we're trying to find. Yeah, the rocks don't have to be touching each other. They don't even have to be very close to each other. But uh, Aaron has used them in other places um, to define boundaries. And uh, I think perhaps they, in 20 years from now, um, I don't have great confidence that there'll be signs, but there will be rocks. Yeah, Perhaps I mean, these are, be... I was just going to add, these are, you know, this is a home ownership community. So I know, you know, rocks, you know, a lot of times maybe make sense when you have a single family home or a development that, you know, will not be maintained. But I mean, there's, there's going to be 30 families that are going to be living here and, you know, they're, they're going to have a lot of pride in the, the houses that they've paid for. You know, they're going to be putting a lot of money into the homeowners association kind of paying on a yearly basis so i mean maintenance of these areas you know will remain whether it's year 5 10 or 20 you know on this site it's definitely not a set it and forget it type of development i hear the nice words i'll just reiterate that rocks don't erode maybe there could be some kind of 
replacement criteria in the HOA agreement or something that's it probably be like every 20 years or something but I do like signs because they tell people why the boundary is there and I think that's good um but I do hear what you're saying Alex about replacement go ahead Erin yeah, so historically, the commission has used a series of different um, structures to define the mitigation areas, um, stone boundaries, uh, split rail fencing, signage, or rebar markers as well. So um, usually if they have one type of marker, they you know, they would just use one type of marker. Um, one example is Canton, uh, Canton Ave, where we recently permitted a single family house. We um, allowed them to install um, the signage because putting in rocks around the wetland boundary would have been a little um, sort of visually and also to the wetland, not, not really a um, great placement. So just to throw that out there that like, it's kind of like they, we have done one or the other in the past in those mitigation areas. Sarah, go ahead, Andre. I uh, I had an idea along the lines of uh, what you what Michelle had um, that you could just uh, put something into the um, into the contract for the management agency to ensure that uh, the signs are replaced every X amount of years or that the signs are there and visible. Um, I have no problem with uh, signage or um, or rocks, whatever uh, management would choose. Thanks, Andre. Jason? Yeah, sorry, this is not about the rocks, um, but, and this may be something of a, a dumb question, so please forgive me, but uh, most of the time I've been looking at this, I've been looking at the 50 and the 100 foot buffer, but is there not a 200 foot riverfront buffer? Doesn't Mill River run through the southeastern portion of this project no it's not it's not a uh, it's an intermittent stream so it's not jurisdictional to riverfront i don't know if it's jurisdiction if it's intermittent but aaron go ahead so there there is a perennial stream which runs um on the the northeast side of this property which i believe is eastman brook um and that does have a 200 foot riverfront area but the 200 foot riverfront area only casts from the river to route 63 so it doesn't go beyond the properties on the east side of route 63 um the stream that's in the rear of the property is an intermittent stream uh, the stream that um, has the 100 foot buffer which is on the south side of the property which is mill river and it's intermittent there no it's a it's a intermittent tributary that flows into the mill river the mill river does not flow along the back of this property okay. this this property it flows the intermittent stream flows behind this property then it flows under summer street and then it comes out on the other side of Summer Street and flows into the Mill River, which is on the south side of Summer Street. So it's not it's not anywhere close to the site. I mean, it's <laughs> relatively close, but it's not like abutting the site or on the site, the Mill River. Okay. Uh, thanks. It's not Cushman Brook either. I'm just looking at I'm looking at a Google map here and it says that it's Mill River. It and then if you go under Summer Street, it looks like it potentially turns into Cushman Brook. So that is just why it came up now. I was like, what? This doesn't yeah. look like the Mill River, but if I it can, is. I can pull up a map to clarify this if that would be helpful. Um, just take me a second to get there. Yeah, I just want to make sure because in looking at that, then there is an awful lot of work. If that were, if there were a 200 foot buffer, there seems to be an awful lot of work in that 200 foot. Yeah, it's not. So. It's not the Cushman Brook, I can assure you. Um, but I was going to say, I can pull up if you want maps. It's, I mean, you can see, I mean, Google Maps is great in a lot of ways, but I mean, Mass Mapper is a better resource for kind of the uh, different types of streams in the area. But correct, yeah, both both are well beyond that 200 foot distance. If you look at stream stats, I think it will show you that it's not a riverfront area. Yeah, it's not, it's not on the... Um... USGS most current USGS topo as intermittent. So I'm I'm just pulling up. I'll pull this up so that you you guys. Can Aaron, see. while you're doing that, is there you know you you just mentioned stream stats, uh, mass 
something or other, um, USGS, is there one specific GIS layer or mapping tool that applicants are required to use? to determine whether a stream is intermittent riverfront or, you know. The, the... Yeah, the most current USGS topographic map is what's referenced in the regulations. Um, so this is Eastman Brook. This is the one that I referenced that is across the street. Um, so this one runs this way. This is the site right here. Um, the, this intermittent stream flows about like this and then comes down here, crosses under Summer Street and down. And then this is Cushman Brook Mill River down here. So it's, you know, this site is is here. This is an intermittent stream. It's not even shown on the town um, layer. Uh, so just I want to, <laughs> there is no way that this is uh, the Cushman Brook or Mill River. It's, I mean, you can see that this is Puffer's Pond right here. This is, this is Cushman, the Cushman Brook flows into the Puffer's Pond and then it comes out the Mill River and the Mill River flows down here. So it's, it's a significant distance away. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to. Always good to clarify. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so we've had some comments, Alex. I, I don't, I don't know where you're at on the signs. I like the idea of the homeowners being educated on what the purpose is of the mitigation and sort of the ecology of it. So I'm in favor of that. With as we discussed, some kind of you know requirement of stipulation on replacement by the HOA, and maybe in consideration of what types of sign we could um, make it so that it's not like an onerous thing to replace them all. Um, in the future. Okay. Bruce, go ahead. You're on mute. Just noting that Katie Olia from Stonefield is still as an attendee rather than in the meeting. I tried to add her in as a panelist, okay. but she declined to join as a panelist. Okay. Alex? Yeah, just going back to rocks, um, I'd be happy with something like a split rail fence. Uh, Kids uh, might get hurt on rocks, but they uh, a spill rail fence would would speak well along with signs, and and I'm thinking primarily on the south side, not so much not so much um, on the north side. Josh, Jessica, do you have any comments on split rail fence? Oh. So I think one of the so the the homeowners and they they haven't decided yet what they're going to do at the limited use areas whether they're going to you know pin the corners whether you know they are going to put in certain areas some type of fencing and I would say we would you know we would want to kind of encourage the commission to move away from you know, physical barriers like fencing um, or rocks and things like that and you know maybe it's a decision you know that the homeowners make you know through the process that you know they would like to see you know, fencing along, you know, the outer perimeter of the site. Um, you know, we think the fence is a, is a great place to start. Uh, I mean, sorry, the signs is a great place to start. There's going to be a professional property management company maintaining these areas. So, um, you know, we're, we're comfortable, you know, with that feature, you know, again, given kind of that, that dense um, vegetation that's back there as well, you know, again, I think it'll create a nice line between Kind of what is the you know the residence area as well as you know what is you know part of this preserved area. Thanks. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know who is first. Like with Andre. Yeah. Um. Um. Forgive me if I missed it, but uh, did we give the public a uh, chance to comment at all? I have asked the public to raise hands if they were interested. Um, right, Paris, did you. you have something? Okay. Um, I guess one thing, have we talked about what your process is for removing the knotweed? So we did at the last meeting, we did file a uh, management plan. Okay. The OMP. Commissioners reviewed. Sorry, I did not have a chance. Um, yeah, um, there, but is we a, did, there yes, was we... a submitted um, invasive species management plan. Okay. All right. Okay, um, are there any other questions from commissioners on this one?
No. Okay. Well, there's a few odds and ends that maybe we can continue conversing about, um, like uh, the bird boxes. I mean, it's a great idea. I don't know if it's appropriate or not there. So maybe I'll do a drive by and just weigh in on that. <laughs> um, but otherwise, I think we're ready to move on with this one. So, Aaron, do you think you can pull up the slide? Hey, commissioners, looking for a motion. All right, I'll move to close the public hearing for 20-40 Boa Lane and orders of condition uh, DEP 0890724 under the State Wetlands Protection Act and under Wetland Protection Town of Amherst General Bylaws Article 3.31 and regulations with the drafted boilerplate and special conditions. Second. Andre on the motion, Bruce on the second. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Alex? Nay. Okay. And I don't see Laura anymore. All right, I'm an aye. Okay, motion passes. All right, Jessica, Josh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Good luck out there. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate all the help. Okay, that was it for our hearings. Um, again, public, if you have any questions, please just raise your hand and I'm gonna take public comment at the end. Um, Otherwise, we have two agenda items. One was to discuss limitations on ongoing continuances and review denial policies. So at our last meeting, um, there are several really great comments about this. So I'm hoping everybody can hearken back to that and remember what you said. Um, Aaron's also checked in with a town attorney and has gotten some good guidance on uh, you know, what the confines is about what we can decide here. So maybe Aaron, you can just give us an update on that yes yes um so i'm just gonna say, say some general comments and it'll kind of lead me into where the town attorney went so um on a regular basis we're going to be getting applications that we can't approve the first day emerson court being a good example like open and close on the same on the same date there are frequently situations where an applicant files and we have uh you know, a series of back and forth revisions or edits. Um, and in certain situations where we have a peer reviewer, for example, or where DEP issues a file number and we have to open the, the um, public hearing and work with the applicant on necessary revisions to their plan, we're going to have situations where some hearings are continued for a period of time. Um, that being said, um, I did speak with the town attorney about, you know, some of the more um, atypical <laughs> examples of, of continuations that we've dealt with, like, you know, the, the UMass permit being one great example where we've had like 13 continuations and um, no update uh, other than one written, written, partial written response. And he did agree that those types of open-ended um, ongoing continuations were were not a good thing to have happen. His recommendation for that type of scenario would be that for future continuances that the board um, state that the continuance is contingent or subject to the applicant um, providing additional information. So for example, um, I think we should keep in mind what the commission's expectation is for that particular hearing and state, um, you know, either the applicant has to respond to the staff comments um, within either a 30 day window or a 60 day window um, and then continue for that period of time to allow them adequate time to respond. Um, 
or to state that they have to provide some sort of an update to the commission to substantiate the rationale for why the continuances are being requested. In other words, not just we'd like a continuance, but we'd like a continuance for the following reasons because we're in the process of performing the following due diligence, which is taking time. Um, the um, uh, town attorney did indicate that some commissions build into our um, bylaw regulations um uh a limitation to the number of continuances so like in our bylaw regulations in the future we could c incorporate something to the effect of three continuances in a row without a valid basis could be that grounds for denial um whereas if they're you know requesting multiple continuations with no update to the board on what's going on or no no communication with staff on what's going on that that would be a grounds for denial but he didn't recommend um using that type of like leaning on that type of um, denial purpose without it being written into our regs so really we should be pushing on the wetlands protection act in this case since we don't have anything in our bylaw that's specific to it um, and and the wetland protection act does have some strong language with regard to denials for lack of information we would just have to state what information is missing and why it's necessary for the board to make a decision and give them ad an adequate amount of time that's reasonable to respond to that um, request. I think that sums up his comments with regard to continuations, um, but happy to Thanks, Aaron. More. Go ahead, Bruce. Is there anything that precludes us from saying that we're going to continue a hearing or a, a meeting two months from now? without it being a negotiation with the applicant. It's just, you know, you've had three opportunities to come every two weeks, you haven't done anything. And so we're gonna send it way out there in the future and let you get your act together. Yeah, so one thing he did say was that we should have permission from the applicant for, for a continuation. Even a two week one. Right, just that we should have, you know, some consensus from the applicant or their representative that um, that they're okay with the con with the continuation because, so, you know, a good example of this is like um, the commission, like let's say the applicant is asking the commission to render a decision and the commission's like, ah, oh, no, we don't want to issue a decision, we just want to keep kicking the can down the road. It could be used both ways, and so it's it's kind of a legal security for the applicant that if they're ready for the commission to make a decision one way or another that. Um, okay. I think, yeah, I think that the um, the open meeting law, or there's, or uh, maybe the Wetlands Protection Act actually uh, has it to where there's a, a, a 21 days um, to make a decision. And I think if we were to start to try to kick it down the road uh, ourselves, um, we'd end up with uh, with problems. And and I think Aaron just just nail uh, Aaron, you just nailed it there. Uh, where it has to be uh, with the uh, agreement uh, of the applicants if we're going to keep moving it down. That twenty one days is that with the DEP filing, or is that? Right. Is... So within 21 days of the DEP issuing a file number, um, we have to open a public hearing within that period of time, because that basically that's the DEP saying that under the Wetland Protection Act, the application is complete. Now we have a bylaw so we can open the hearing and say, we're going to we're accepting this. We understand under state law that that the state accepted the application as complete. However, just because DEP issued a file number does not mean that the project meets regulatory compliance under WPA or under our local wetland bylaw. So we can say you need to revise your plan in order to meet the regulations. Um, but um, the other 21 day that kicks in is that once we close the public hearing, we have 21 days to issue an order of conditions. That's on a notice of intent application. Now with a request for determination, when, when, uh, <laughs> Let me get this, let me get this right. Within 21 days of us opening the hearing on an RDA, we have to issue a determination of applicability unless we have permission of the applicant to continue. Uh, RDAs are a little bit different. So 
because it's a, a more sort of baseline permit, um, there's an expectation that if an applicant files an RDA that they get a permit within 21 days. Um, okay, I have a question. So, so that it was recommended that we only continue or we deny continuation or allow our continuation based on the provision of a good reason, good rationale from the applicant. I mean, given our current situations for big continuances here, has they've always give a rationale, there's always a reason. Like, are we changing anything in the way we do it if we if we instituted that because everybody has a reason why they need to continue it like are we <laughs> buying ourselves any i don't know well anything? i think there's nothing wrong with saying we're going to give you some time to do your due diligence but if there if it reaches a point where we're not getting communicated with the commission can say um we want Okay. This information to us within 30 days, 60 days, and if we don't, then we're going to deny for lack of information. And that that is a legal grounds for denial if they don't respond okay. with the request. So the benefit would be like we could request specific information because we generally are communicated with and they generally have an excuse for why they need to continue it. But so it would allow us. Is that true? I mean, it seems to be true. Well, yeah, there's always a reason, right? And 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 this in the same way that the that the applicant has the discretion to um, allow the commission a continuance, the commission also has the discretion to issue a continuance. Okay, but you don't want to deny a continuance unless you have given the applicant notice in writing. This is information that the Conservation Commission needs, bulleted outline of what is missing, what information is necessary in order for the commission to continue their review and make their decision, and state very clearly, this information is necessary for the commission to act, and if it's not provided by said date and give them adequate time, then at that point, the commission could say, it's been 60 days, we've requested this information, you haven't provided it to us, we're not issuing you a continuation, we're closing the hearing, and we're denying the project. I've seen it done, and it's completely legal to do that. But that's okay. the only rationale that I would recommend that the commission not grant a continuance. All right, um, Bruce. Alex was first. No, I think Alex. Bruce was, go ahead. Just go ahead, Bruce. Um, well, we've already uh, had a precedent of trying the middle ground, which was, to have Aaron discuss it, even though they give a reason every two weeks, ever have, have a serious heart-to-heart -heart discussion with the applicant about how much more time is it going to take? And then setting a hearing date a month or six weeks further out, which she's already done at least once because we suggested it. Mm -hmm. Alex? Yeah, I just wanted to make clear that we're not really talking about the casual continuance. We're talking about those that go on for months without explanation, and we have a couple of those. Um, I'm not going to mention who, but there's one that's been going on. I can't remember how long, maybe three months. And so I think we're trying to come up with a clear way forward to avoid uh, continually putting something on the agenda for a continuance, if for no other reason, to save us time. We Continuances still take time on our agenda and if we can minimize those that just keep going without any stopping point i'd like to see us focus on the exception rather than the rule and the, Jason. the rule, okay sorry yeah so you know we continue to bunch tonight with good reason i don't think we're really too concerned about them or i'm this came up because of olympia drive that just goes on forever without explanation. And so to make clear, well, how do we communicate uh, enough is enough and and be on the right side of, of, of doing that? Jason? Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate what Alex said, but also state, you know, it's not, it's not fair for anybody who potentially wants to make public comment on any of these projects 
if they're just continuously continued and continued and continued. Um, so with with the one that the project that Alex mentioned, I know that we haven't really, Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong, we haven't really reached out to ask for any additional information from them. We've just kind of let it go as well. Isn't that correct? Um, we haven't really pushed, I believe you said at one meeting, you really haven't pushed them because, you know, they have a lot of other projects and we had a lot of projects. And so we were not uh, in any hurry to get them to come back just, or, you know, just, just to do a continuance. Yeah, there was a flurry of time there where we had like nine hearings on the agenda and I wasn't knocking down their door trying to get them to come come back. Um but but yeah, now it's now that it's slowed down to some degree, <laughs> not substantially because we're still having six six hearings per agenda and we just closed two tonight, but we have two more popping up on the next one. So, um you know, it's it there is there has been a it, it's not a trickle. It's been a steady flow of permits that we've been seeing. And um, I so at the other piece of this that I think is really important is just because an applicant requests a continuation doesn't mean the commission can't discuss it if they so choose. If if at the next meeting, which is on March 13th for that particular hearing, the commission says, hold on. I don't want to issue a continuance right now. I want to discuss this. We can. The applicant was given a pretty exhaustive list of issues that we asked them to respond to. They partially responded, but there are still a series of outstanding issues that we haven't gotten responses to. So, uh, Dave. Yeah, I I just want to say. I mean, I've heard a lot of really. This is a good conversation. I've heard a lot of <clears throat> good takeaways. You know, I think Alex is right. Um, you know, we're we're mainly talking about the exception, not the rule here. We we've had a couple of these that have gone on. I agree with um Jason. You know, this is also about this is about the commission's time, staff time. It's also about uh a better's times and, and interested parties. You know, how do they follow these things for months on end? And we need to respect that. But I think it's generally the exception. What I heard from Erin, and I, I, I thank her for, uh, she and I talked about her discussion with our town attorney. I think that's a pretty good plan to move forward. I think this is about clear written communication with deadlines and clarifying the commission's expectations as to what you must see, not a half list, not three out of five, we want these five things by this date. And if you don't have them, then we are left with other alternatives. And we've never really, in my memory, pushed that to that edge of, you know, what is what is allowed. And I think we heard crystal clear from our town attorney that we you can do that. So I think it's about clear, consistent communication and give them 60 days, give them 45 days, whatever it is, and you need these three things, these five things, if you don't have them, then you are not inclined to give another, you know, uh, three months or two months or two weeks, you're done. And let the chips fall where they may. Okay, so just to clarify, that would be we hear, we have the hearing, and at the continuation, we then give them 60 days to provide said set um, requirements. And so we continue it for until 60 days from then. Is that, would that be what you're talking about? So then we can push it back for more than two weeks. I, I wasn't scenario. saying there was a magic to 60 days. I'm well, sorry, yeah, just, yeah. but a, some Period number. Yeah. Right, but more than two weeks. So back to what we were talking about, like push it out a couple months to just not be continuing it every two weeks. Okay, Jason. Yeah, so I I would like to seek further clarification on that too, Michelle. Once we get to that, just arbitrary, we'll just say sixty day time frame, and we don't, if they don't give us what we're looking for, and and Davey said, all right, we're done. Does that mean? What does that mean then? We are rejecting their NOI and then they have to start the whole process over again once they have essentially a plan, you know, whatever plan set and they need to file a new NOI. 
new abutters notices and all of the, everything gets started over. We are rejecting the project and they need to start over. Mm -hmm. Or we okay. could give them the opportunity to withdraw, you know, say either provide this information to us within 30 days or withdraw the application. And in either case, they'd have to re-notify abutters or, or repost the legal ad. But we've had folks withdraw as well um, in those scenarios where they know they're like, you know, we're at an impasse. We don't have the money to keep going with, uh, you know, due diligence or site design. We're just going to, we're just going to go, you know, do something else. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think as long as we have a clear paper trail, they've they've been communicated with with the wishes of the commission via staff, and uh, if they don't, you know, if they don't uh, perform by that by that date with the information you want, then at that meeting you can decide you can ask them to withdraw or you can deny the the the, the permit, and it starts over. I think that's a very strong message to send. I'm, and again, going back to what Alex said, this is the exception, not the rule. I, you know, I, for one, I really respect that this commission, since I've been working with it for many years, has always worked collaboratively with most applicants and, and projects get done in a good way that, that protects resource areas. And we make progress and, and homeowners get to do this and, Developers do that, and roads are built, and infrastructure to uh, maintain, and all of that. But you know, I think it's the exception to the rule. But it does; it's costly in time, energy, and resources. So, I think as long as you're clear in your communication, town attorney will support you. Okay, so I'm I'm seeing some clarity of process coming together here. So then the two sort of subjective things will be when when do we decide to. Um, give them a deadline and create the criteria and then how long do we make the the extension or deadline for so those are still going to be kind of difficult and you know project dependent um yeah. so have we talked about at this point like how often we continue or is it just gonna sort of be like a feeling that we haven't been communicated with enough and we're all sort of in consensus that we need to give some deadline to the applicant. Anyway, that's just some thought. Go ahead, Alex. We have a notice uh, on the website that folks have to get their material in, you know, by Friday or whatever it is, the week before our meeting. And that that's up in front of everybody. Um, I wonder, short of changing our rigs, which I think we'll probably put this on the list when we do change our regs. But in the meantime, can we simply add a notice right underneath the business about when everything needs to be filed in order to be included in the following meeting? Can we put a policy statement uh, for everybody to see or do we have to go through some formal process? Um, if it can be simple and just add something to where we already post a notice, then I would suggest that uh, maybe Erin draft something for our consideration, unless she's already got something, and that it be put right there underneath the uh, notice on when things have to be filed, on what happens with 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 extended continuances. Go ahead, Andre. Yeah, um, I th I think I think we can put no um, kind of. Uh, Try to answer uh, Alex's uh, question here, Alex. Uh, I think that we can put notices uh, as long as they're backed up by law. Um, you know, policies as long as they're uh, legally drawn up, if you would. So if you know, if we're gonna put a notice that uh, that kind of uh, reiterates a. Uh, uh, something in our bylaws or reiterate something in the um, in the Wetlands Protection Act, I, I think we can do that. But otherwise, uh, I think what we've been told is that we would need to um, update the law. And then we could put a notice referring us to what uh, what the law is saying. Do you, you mean know, the law or do you mean our local regulations? Well, our local regulations are a law. So yes. Yeah, yeah, I thought I just went. trying to differentiate <laughs> between state law and and our rules good enough um i i, I think 
Um, I, I think I think it would have whatever it is that we are posting um, would have to be in accordance with uh, with either or or both. Yeah. So either the uh, the Wetlands Protection Act or the uh, bylaws or both. That would be something like we have the ability to not continue. I mean, we can't. There's no deadline law. Right. So um, anyway, maybe we can think about that. So. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the uh, the the, the I, I think that um, we can um, deny for a lack of uh, providing. I think Aaron made the uh, uh, said the words for lack of uh, um, responding to information requests. Um, right, denial so, for lack of information. For lack of information. So I think that is something that we could put on the website that, uh, you know, if, uh, you know, for if um, applicants have not responded to uh, uh, requests for information, and if there is a lack of information for an extended for X amount of time, uh, then we, uh, then the commission uh, may do. Uh, close the hearings and deny uh, applications. I think that, uh, uh, Alex, I think that would uh, would work because it's in the law. Fine with that, Bruce. Thank you. You're muted. Given the discussion, I'd like Dave and Aaron to come up with a draft, check with the attorney and show it to us and then we can finalize it. Aaron and Dave, sound good to you guys? Yes, and and we do have some language about denials in our bylaw, so I'll I'll take a look at that and try to wordsmith something that seems, um, you know, to hold muster with state and local law, and um, and then we can take a look at it maybe at the next meeting. Okay, Bruce. Again, something else? Nope. Dave, go ahead. Yeah, no, we want to talk about one other topic. I'm fine with that. I, I think we would want to just talk that through with, with the town attorney, too, as, as well as Aaron can put something together. Um, Michelle, you said something a few minutes ago, which is, you know, it struck me as, you know, again, this is the exception to the rule. Most applicants move at a, at a reasonable pace or have, you know, circumstances, um, some of which are beyond their control and they move through the process. So I, I just want to keep that in mind that this is not a, a common occurrence, but it is, it's every situation is going to be unique. So I don't know if we can create, you know, a structure that, that deals with every one of these, you know, I think it's going to be on a case by case basis. And I think you, I would recommend you all, Erin is going to be the best read of whether, because she's in constant contact with every applicant, She's going to be the best read to say, you know what, Commission, I'm just not hearing. I haven't heard from these folks in three three weeks or three months, and I've asked them repeatedly. I have the email chain to prove that. So I, I just want to say, you know, I think every situation is going to be unique. We haven't had many of these, but yeah, we've had one or two in the last year that are causing so, uh, causing us to have this conversation. So um I just want to make sure we're not too prescriptive here for something that doesn't happen all that much. So anyway, just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, I agree. So I guess we're just we're understanding what our um what our reach is here as a commission and just that we'd have to discuss on a case by case basis and discuss with Aaron if we're being provided communications and and information in a timely manner and if things are moving forward. So um Yes, we have one more thing on the agenda. Um, if, if there's no more questions, I think we can move on to that. And this is, is this relative to what Alex had brought up about interdepartmental? Okay, I don't know what it's about, so <laughs> take it away, Aaron. It's uh, other policy issues, questions, and concerns is the agenda item. Yes, yeah, so um, 
Alex had sent an email um, to me and Michelle about a couple sort of policy related items. And so I just wanted to circle back because I did talk to the town attorney on um, both of those items. Uh, the first being the batteries um, and our ability to either not accept an application without for for this is specifically for a battery storage project our ability to not accept an application if there's not a fire department sign off and or to deny a project if there's not a battery or not a fire department sign off um so alex's comments relative to this was um he thinks withholding an order of conditions based on not having fire department sign off would be problematic. Um, he said that. Um, he the attorney. Yes. Yep. Um, that fire code is beyond the commission's purview. And he thinks that it's, it's a very hypo hypothetical condition for the commission to um, uh, predict, I guess that, um, there might be a fire on a given site. And um, he recommended that, number one, we either have some serious um, documentation that um, there is some sort of, you know, scientific evidence that there would be um, contamination to groundwater or surface water as a result of the issue. Or he recommended that we had a condition that the applicant should obtain all necessary permits in you know including the fire department um from the fire department before the project moved forward um so that was the guidance from him relative to that um do you want to talk about that first or you want me to go on to the other one alex has his hand up alex do you want to wait okay. or do you want to respond no, i want to respond i well, I appreciate the town attorney's uh, point of view. I don't think he was well briefed. Not that Aaron didn't do a good job briefing him, but I don't think he understands the issue. And um, Aaron and Dave and I talked for an hour about this. And I thought Dave well understood and Aaron understood the difficulty of having the commission go through a project like a battery storage project and uh, the one on Montague Road is a perfect example where uh, they lay uh, they go to the trouble of laying out a project and we spend time looking at it and then the fire department is comes after us and because of its conditions the whole project gets turned around so we've already spent time on it and now they're coming in with a big revised plan because the fire trucks need access the existing access doesn't work they need a a turnaround, they don't like three point turns, and all of a sudden we've the, the applicants having to redesign the whole project. So there's an argument to be made that the fire department come first. And I don't think the town attorney understood that, that we have a problem in the process by, by which a project goes through the town review uh, and where the fire department should fit in that. And it would save all of us a lot of time if the fire department um, let 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 the applicant know what their requirements are before we spend time uh, on it, because as I said, the fire department can turn it upside down, or even uh, come in with requirements that kills the project. And I don't think the town attorney, given what Aaron just reported to us, I don't think he understood that. And yeah. Bruce, so Bruce was there. Jason was there on the battery storage project on on um, Montague Road and they both heard from Chris Bascom and they, um, the applicant said, oh, wow, this is news to us. We gotta go back to the drawing board. So there's a perfect example of why the fire department should come first in our process. So I, there's a- I don't, Go ahead. There's a couple, um, I guess, things. So the first is that um, I am, um, we, we generally have a uh, pre-permitting review process, which most, I would say, permits go through, which is particularly complex projects where staff 
would meet either virtually or around a table, um, either with the applicant or internally to review things and review compliance of given um, elements of a plan to provide guidance back to a given applicant. Um, in the case of Montague Road, that's a very unique outlying situation. Um, but we're, we're trying to resolve that by have because they they should have had a pre uh, a pre permitting meeting over a year ago and it didn't happen and so I'm working to make that happen right now so that we can have the all of the input from the fire department um, incorporated into the plan design and and obviously that's that's an important thing and so you know it's 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 like a layer cake there's multiple issues here but like so let's say an applicant comes to us with a with a driveway proposal we permit the driveway. And they go to build and the fire, they can't get a permit because the fire department needs to adjust the widths. They would need to come back to us to get the approval. Now, I know that that's a lot of time and an effort for us to have to go back and amend it. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's it's the applicant's due diligence as to whether they incorporate the necessary bylaws and requirements as far as road width and turning radius and, and all of those things. So I think part of it is town staff need to do pre permitting meetings. Part of it is applicants do need to do their due diligence and incorporate these things. What I was talking about specific to battery storage was relative to like the Hickory Ridge discussion where there was a potential for a, a battery to be fire prone. And we're saying we're not going to approve this without fire department approval. Otherwise, the permit will not pass. That was where like all other elements of the plan are in compliance. All other elements of the plan meet town code, except for that. That is where he's saying he would not recommend that we deny a project strictly because a given battery is fire prone. That that's really, you know, if 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 we issue our permit or if we deny the permit, it goes to DEP and DEP approves it. And that's the bottom line is we would have no grounds. Like if we denied it, DEP is just going to issue a superseding order and we don't have a leg, we, then we lose the permit. We no longer have local control over it. So um, we just have to have like some robust scientific documentation or um, other technical documentation to substantiate our rationale, um, like groundwater, surface water contamination or some other issue um, that is pertinent to CONCOM jurisdiction. Jason, you're muted. Sorry. Can you clarify why, uh, how, how it works when DEP issues a superseding order? Yes. So let's say, for example, a given applicant comes to us. Um, so they're filing both under state and local law. If we issue a permit or deny a permit and the applicant's not happy, they have the right to appeal. So they can appeal to DEP and they can appeal to Superior Court. Um, I've seen this happen before where we deny something and DEP turns around and approves it. And then like in, in one case, DEP turned around and approved it. And then we had the that um, SORAD in that case was appealed by three separate parties. Um, in the case of the the Tanbrook um, SORAD. Um, ultimately, we were able to negotiate through that to get the applicant to withdraw, and we sort of started over again. But I have worked in situations where there were superseding orders of conditions, and they were a nightmare to administer because we, the, ta the town in which the permit was issued, was not owned by the Conservation Commission. It was owned by DEP. So DEP was in control of that permit, and they administered it. When we issue an order of conditions, it's a very strong document. Um, we have a lot of um, oversight and a lot of sort of power to control site conditions. Um, when DEP does that, they're not here every day looking at it um, to determine if it's in compliance or not. So <clears throat> I like to avoid having a DEP superseding order at all costs. I've only had it happen to me once in close to 20 years. Um, and we worked through that and were able to get a withdrawal. Um, but 
they, you know, and the part I haven't talked about is the appeal to superior court. Um, and that is really um, the, if, if a bylaw is appealed and it goes to superior court, then ultimately they would be reviewing it to see if the decision that we render is in compliance with our local wetland bylaw and regulations. Okay. And thank you for that. And then, you know, as Alex mentioned, Captain Bascom, he mentioned too that the fire department's trying to figure all this out as well on their end. Um, so it sounds uh, it sounds to me like what you said was, if we approve a project, that's not we're not the last stop. It seems like sometimes we may be the first stop, uh, but we're not the last stop on this approval train. And so if we approve a project, and then the fire department says we need to put a two hundred foot wide road in here, so the fire trucks can turn around, and that changes the design of the project, then that that triggers and that essentially nullifies our approval because the project design has changed and then they have to come back or do they only come back for the portions of the project that have changed they come back for the portions of the project that have changed now so where this can get tricky and michelle and i were talking about this earlier today is there is frequently an expectation from applicants even with very dramatic changes to plans, that when they come back to the Conservation Commission, they want it to be a minor administrative change approval. And there are instances where that's a really bad um, idea. There's instances where it's appropriate based on if something is is indeed a minor administrative change. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a very tricky um, line to walk, I guess, in terms of, you know, because if the commission has discretion, as to whether they're going to require an amendment to the permit or not. And ultimately, if it was something like the scenario you described, Jason, absolutely, they should come in with an amendment, which means they re-notify a butters, repost the legal ad, and we review it like we're starting <clears throat> from scratch, essentially, with the change. I will say that we're often pressured to just consider it a minor administrative change, and often that's what happened. So just put that in the back of your head next time it comes up. Dave, so go Oh, sorry, sorry. But are, we, yeah. are we in our purview to say, or like, who makes that determination if it's a minor administrative change? If we're like, oh, you just doubled the width of the road and now, you know, 30% more of your project is in the buffer. Like, this is not a, this is a essentially a redesign of, yeah. you know, half the project size, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, and, and we're talking about this specific, we're using this Montague Road as, in my mind, as an example, right? Like, it's not a very big project. So increasing the width of the road increases like the overall footprint of the project by like at least half, I would think, right? Like that is not a minor change. Mm -hmm. Are right. we the ones that get to determine what a minor administrative change is? Yes. Okay. It, yep. I, I have a follow-up to that. Uh, is that is minor uh, administrative change defined in the law? <laughs> yes it is but it is. And it's in okay. the, it is and i encourage everyone to go look at it and it's always subjective but I, dave go ahead will do so one this might be a longer conversation than you know to start at 9 15 or whatever but i also want to be careful i really don't think we should be talking about montague road specifically i think we should be talking in the abstract it, it's not on the agenda mm -hmm. we're talking about a specific project so Let's just go bigger picture, 5,000 feet or whatever. So a couple of quick thoughts. One, you know, I don't, I don't disagree with some of the things that have been said about process. I think actually Aaron and I have a meeting, I believe tomorrow with uh, permitting staff to talk yes. about this issue kind of town wide, what's going well, what's working well, what's maybe not. And some of these examples that we've talked about and others will be brought up. So that's number one. Um, I think the more work staff can do to, as Aaron uh, uh, indicated, the more work that staff can do to guide the applicant early in the design process, the better, right? With feedback from the town, the town uh, fire department, the uh, building commissioner, uh, planning staff, conservation staff, and uh, who am I forgetting? The town, town engineer. NDA. I mean. <laughs> I stand by this, you know, Amherst has one of the most robust permitting 
pathways and systems, certainly in Western Mass. In fact, we are often criticized by for how robust our permitting pathways are. You can take that for however you, however you want. I often say there that our goal is to be efficient, to be thorough, to be fair, to be equitable, and to follow the law, the local law and state law on on permitting. Um, but we have a lot of we have a lot of um, layers. Let's put it that way in Amherst, and we have a lot of committees to go through. However, we don't always get it right. We're not perfect, and I think battery storage in general has challenged us, like many communities. We permitted how many, um, three or four solar projects without incident, without question, early in, early in the solar uh, arena because they didn't have batteries. It was much easier. So I think these battery projects have added a layer of complexity. I mean, I think that's just a fact. So we're learning as we go. So I'm so I'm I'm agreeing. I think we we as staff need to assess our pre-permitting um, uh, process a little bit more, particularly when it comes to a uh, battery, uh, a solar project with battery storage or standalone uh, uh, battery projects. So I'm just offering that out there that I think we're going to take a look at that. Aaron could kind of report back in two weeks. I believe the meeting is tomorrow or Friday. I know it's on my calendar. Um, so I think we'll have some more feedback for you in two weeks. Um, so I don't disagree. I I am a I I uh, the the town attorney did say one thing that resonated with me, which is in your order of conditions, you can always add a condition and all other permits. You know, Aaron, help me out here. You know. Mm -hmm. The building, I mean, nothing gets built, nothing gets built in this town without the building commissioner often has the final say of when something gets built. So you can always add an order that that makes sure every other board and committee that is relevant and every other department has signed off on a project. So that's always available to you in the order of conditions. And I think uh, our town attorney, you know, certainly reiterated that. So. That's all I have to say for tonight. It might be a longer conversation and we can have it on the agenda in two weeks and give you an update on, on staff feedback. Thanks, Dave. Alex? Yeah, I just want to make clear that uh, I I don't think I... I didn't put in what I wrote to Aaron, the idea of denying a permit. I think what I wrote was um, uh, that we not entertain a, an application until the fire department has reviewed it and how we manipulate that i don't know but when an applicant comes into town a first contact is chris brestrup and she says you go to the zoning board first you go to the concom second you go to the planning board next and i don't know where the fire department fits what I'd like for Chris Bestrup to tell somebody is if they've got a battery storage project or a project involving batteries, and keep in mind, people in town, residents, are putting storage batteries in their homes. I mean, they're all over the place. Um, but we're talking about commercial battery projects and solar projects with batteries. What I'd like for Chris Bestrup to say to people is, since you're a battery project, I suggest you go to the fire department first, then go to the ZBA, then go to the CONCOM, so that we change the order in which that process takes place. And I understand the process is well entrenched and change is hard, but it would save us and the applicant a lot of time and money if Chris would direct them to the fire department early, early in the process. And that's what I was after. Now, I don't I don't want to go into a discussion about what happens if we deny. I never brought that up. Well, yeah. emerging <laughs> technologies. <laughs> okay, I, but, go ahead, Aaron. But but to Alex's point, if an applicant comes submits an application, we have 21 days to open the public hearing. If the applicant wants us to review the project, we can say, oh, we need a review by this person or that person. But at the end of the day, if they say, no, I don't want a continuance, I want you to vote on this, we have to vote on it and we have to make a decision. Does it meet the the state and local regulations or not? And 
there is nothing in the state or local regulations that say that the fire department has to sign off on it before we can entertain it. So, and, and in that case, we'd be stuck in a situation where we didn't have um, a regulatory rationale for the denial. So that's, that's all we, we have regulatory constraints, I guess, is all I'm getting at. I, I would just quickly add that um, I think there is basis for that because based on what the fire department says, how they would treat a fire, how they would implement the road, it would have impacts on how we assess um, impacts to wetlands. And so there is consequence for that that would at least back us continuing it with the need for more information. So I don't think that we'd have to vote. I mean, I think that our regulations say that, yes, more information is needed to understand what the actual impacts to wetlands are. My two cents when you're going to have these staff conversations. Go ahead, Alex. Or... I just would ask that staff hear the commission, at least this one here, that I think in the case of battery storage, it would be very helpful if Chris Brestrup would change the order in which an application goes through. They may, they they do what she says to do. They don't just come to us willy nilly. They go through a process, and and I think you understand exactly what I'm saying, and I think Dave does too. That it would save us a lot of time and energy if we don't get into a project that uh, involves batteries that does not first have the fire department's okay. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, and I don't know how long you want to go here, Michelle. Um, yeah, no, we hear you, Alex. Um, I don't want to go back and forth, but I will say that not all applicants start with Chris Brestrup. Applicants enter the process in five or seven different ways, including we do have a permit administrator, uh, Jennifer Mullen. So many applicants start with Jennifer and then they, you know, but I agree with you, particularly with uh, solar battery, pro any solar project with battery uh, or standalone battery, should, you know, should early on get input from the fire department, no question about it. So we're going to bring that message to the um, to the meeting, which includes the fire department tomorrow. The other thing I was going to say is, of course, we should all recognize that the town is in the process of developing a solar bylaw, right? So some of this will undoubtedly be addressed in the solar bylaw. Okay. Um, that the status of that is that has been Aaron, help me out. That has been the draft has been sent from the Solar Bylaw Working Group that Laura Pagliarulo was on. And it's in the, it's in the CRC. Yeah, it's pretend. been sent to the Community Resources Committee and it will begin to work its way through the Community Resources Committee up to the uh, uh, town council. So some of this will undoubtedly be in that document. Um, and uh, but batteries are brand new, as as uh, Michelle indicated. You know, evolving, relatively new technology, and we're learning as we go. And hopefully, we don't make mistakes. But we will take this message to the meeting tomorrow, and we'll have more for you in two weeks. Thanks, Dave. Alex, last thing, yeah, maybe just, just real quick, um, uh, commissioners, don't 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 sit back and wait for the CRC on the solar thing, their comments aren't due till June and they have a long process to go through. And I'm hoping that we can do something, make some change to help ourselves long before that. Yeah, good point. Thank you for reminding me. I um, requested from Aaron that maybe we reach out to them um, and then I went on vacation. So it slipped my mind, but um, can we, request some kind of review because we haven't seen that draft since we gave it to them like a year ago or something like that um i don't, I don't want to see it when everybody has decided that they're good with it and then the commission has zero input on it so I, I don't know what the best process is for reaching out to them or for the commission to give comments on it but i don't want to be left out of the process any any advice on how to pursue that or what the appropriate way to do it is, Aaron or Dave? Yeah, Aaron could reach out. I mean, certainly it's it's a public document. The draft is a public document, so we could get that anytime. Okay. Um, 
Things can be hard to find <laughs> on the Amherst website. Aaron, Aaron can track that down through Stephanie okay. Jacobello, our sustainability director. Um, and again, you can you can be mulling it over, you know, spend some time on your agendas and um, be ready for the CRC process when they reach out again with, again, it's an early draft. I think they there may be some preamble that came with it that said, hey, this is, this needs work, CRC, but we're, we're ready to hand it over to you. Okay. Bruce? Your note taker is fading, and we still have enforcement and monitoring reports. We have enforcement? It's not on my agenda. It's on the... Oh, um, yeah. Trillium Way staff proposed possible dates for upcoming site visit, and then it says monitoring reports. I must not have printed page two. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> apologies. Okay. Um, I think we've extended ourselves. The one you sent last week is in the in the no, not that. This is the, the PowerPoint PowerPoint presentation, which is oh, the one. Yeah. That this afternoon it's just a placeholder for trillium way um for us getting out there and having a site visit um to see okay. the site and obviously we're, we're sort of getting into a season where it might be more appropriate to do that but i don't know we might have a cold snap and it's going to be frozen again i'm not quite sure what's going on with the weather um but i can set up a um, a site visit at this point if the commission would like to a trillium um and uh monitoring reports are always in your um uh, your OneDrive folder, so it's kind of just a placeholder on the on the oh, um, agenda okay. that they're there for review, um, and okay. the public comment is also a placeholder, like in case there's anything specific we need to bring up relative to those issues. Yeah. So maybe maybe now is a good time to go to Trillium Way. I have crocuses in my yard and snowdrops in my yard, and for all I know, trilliums will be coming up too. I have a comment back on. Uh, uh, something to say back on the previous topic. I hope we haven't switched yet. Yeah, let's just probably wrap it up because I'm fading with the note taker. And I want to go look for salamanders. <laughs> it's raining. Yeah. So the chair of the CRC just had a meeting with Paul Bachman to get clear how um, that committee can coordinate with town staff. So that's in process. And they will be hearing, yeah, holding hearings and getting input. And I'm sure there's be lots of time for uh, the commission to provide input. And I think I can arrange to get copies of the solar plan to all of you. And assuming that's not deliberative. Well, it's a it's it's a public document, right? So this could just be a link on a website. Maybe that Aaron yeah. could distribute, or we could just find it somehow. That I think good. I can get it and send it to you. Great. Thank you, Alex. So, um, um, anyways, um, I think I've heard from Dave that you're going to have a meeting with Chris, I think it is, or somebody else tomorrow. And um, hopefully... The meeting, yeah, the meeting is with, with a group of staff that are involved in the permitting and pre-permitting um, uh, process. And and we routinely meet, we'll meet with a developer who wants to propose something downtown, University Drive, an apartment complex, uh, a project at Amherst College, a new science center, et cetera, et cetera. So pretty standard process and it'll include an engineer, fire department, uh, building commissioner, planning, zoning, uh, Conservation, of course, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there okay. was yeah. there was uh, one other topic which we can put on for the next meeting, but I'd like to have a discussion about our regs where it talks about invading 20% of the 100-foot buffer and how we handle that and what the regs actually say. And, and just a, it's just a, uh, to put it on the table, I don't want to talk about it now. Right, you mentioned that before. Okay, Andre. Yeah, just a uh, just a note. Um, I sent uh, an email to you all about the open meeting law. 
and um, if uh, if there's uh, folks in the meeting who are out of order and so on. Um, so I sent that, uh, I found the site while we were uh, uh, prepping earlier and um, and the wording and I sent it to you guys in, a, in an email. So look out for that, that's all. Thank you, Andre. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, it was a good discussion. Some of this stuff we generally don't have time for, but um, makes us all better commissioners to hash it out and better understand these things. So thank you everybody for staying on and discussing. Um, but with that, I guess I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Thank you. Second. <laughs> I think Andre on the motion, Jason on the second. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. And I'm an aye. All right. Good night, All everyone. Right. Thanks, Thank everyone. Have a great night. Aaron, can you stay on for a minute or two? Or, do you, or just give me a shout tomorrow, which, which whatever. Yeah, that's probably better. <laughs> yeah. Why don't I? <laughs> yeah, let's talk in the morning, Andre. Thank you. Sounds great. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>